Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. It's my pleasure today to host uh, Nicole King from, from Berkeley. Um, I'm a fan of Nicole's because she's developed, she's a, she's a very unique scientist. She's developed an experimental model organism to test hypotheses about one of the deepest questions in biology, which is the evolutionary origin of multicellular animals. Um, she basically founded a new field uh, of experimental uh, uh, multicellular uh, uh, studies. So the origin of animals represents a pivotal point in the transition in life histories, and it's uh, one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in biology. Um, and understanding the deep roots of where this comes from could help us understand um, how cell-cell interactions in animals give rise to development and how uh, uh, they go wrong in a lot of the diseases that are uh, through adhesion receptors uh, in vascular and, and uh, immune diseases. So um, these days in the post-genome era, most of the way people study evolution is through comparative genomics, looking for animals and finding their common ancestors. But Nicole, she got her bug for her curiosity about this question before, sort of at the time that that uh, genome era was, was blooming. Uh, right about the time she started grad school, there was a, a, a pioneering paper that used comparative genomic approaches uh, that identified a freshwater protease, the coanoflagellates, as at the base of the metazoan tree where uh, multicellularity arose. And coanoflagellates are really interesting. They're sort of a schizophrenic life. They, they live half of their life as a single-celled multi single-celled organism that's free, and then under certain conditions for other parts of their life, they come together as a group and, and function a, as, a, as a, a standalone multicellular organism. And she uh, recognized this and was fascinated it and saw the potential to have a model organism that would actually allow us to, to try to understand the fundamental basis of where multicellularity arose. And she held this passion through her PhD in microbiology at Harvard and then found a lab uh, for her postdoc, uh, um, Sean Carroll, where he let her uh, loose on this problem and uh, um, uh, subsequently uh, started a position at Berkeley as an assistant professor in 2003 and uh, from there uh, became a Puke Scholar in 2004, won a MacArthur Genius Award in 2005, and became an HHMI investigator in 2013. In her lab at Berkeley, she's published a landmark paper on the genome sequence of coanoflagellates, showing that it contained genes that encoded chunks of uh, cell adhesion and cell-cell signaling uh, uh, proteins that are otherwise restricted to metazoans. And by comparing the coano genome to metazoans, she was able to propose that uh, the complexity of cell-cell adhesion and cell surface receptor signaling arose by shuffling these uh, genes, duplicating them, and mutating them, uh, these original domains. Um, since that, she's described the early evolution of cadherin and integrin adhesion uh, receptors, and more le recently, she's begun to identify how the microbiome may influence the decision of unicellular organisms to go multicellular, and she's going to talk about that today. So it's a real pleasure for her to come out here to NIH to talk to us today. Thank you. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. So it, I have to say it is a huge privilege and honor to be here. It's the first time that I've been to the NIH, but I am very much indebted to the NIH for taking some gambles with our incredibly non-model organisms. And so what I'd like to talk to you about today is um, an unexpected direction in which our research has gone and, uh, and tell you about how our early investigations into animal origins have actually allowed us to gain molecular level insights into the ways in which bacteria, bacteria are controlling the biology of eukaryotes. And my hope is that the model that we're setting up here may actually prove to be valuable for identifying important bacterial cues that are relevant to animals. Okay, let me first start, though, by telling you about why we study coanoflagellates. Now, in my laboratory, um, 
our, our underlying motivation is in, to try to understand how animals first evolve. And of course, the field of evolutionary biology has been fascinated by the problem of the, the diversification of animal body plans. And so here are just shown some of the diverse body plans that we can see in animals today. And a great deal of insight has come both from the fields of paleontology and also comparative embryology and comparative genomics. And we're starting to understand how the evolution of expression of important developmental regulators has contributed to the diversification of animals as we see them today. However, there's been relatively little focus on where all of this began. And so in my laboratory, we're interested in taking a phylogenetic framework to try to reconstruct the nature of the organism from which all animals evolved. Now, although we cannot see these organisms in the fossil record, there are reasonable inferences that can be made from a theoretical approach and also a comparative approach. And so because all animals are multicellular, we infer that their last common ancestor was also multicellular, that it had cell differentiation, and that it had mechanisms for coordinating cell function. And we also, by looking at the phylogenetic distribution of unicellular and multicellular organisms can infer that this organism evolved from organisms that had either obligate unicellularity or facultative multicellularity. And so in my laboratory, we're interested in reconstructing these key transitions in evolutionary history. We want to understand what were the genomic and cellular innovations that allowed the onset of multicellularity, and we want to understand how mechanisms for regulating cell differentiation and coordination of function both of which are critical to animal development. How did those evolve? Now, there are many different approaches that are taken um, for thinking about evolutionary transitions such as this. And uh, uh, as Claire told you, in my laboratory, we've uh, both focused on trying to reconstruct genome evolution as it pertains to animal origins. And we've also been doing quite a bit of work on thinking about this new field of evolutionary cell biology and trying to understand where the unique cell types of animals, such as epithelia and neurons and muscle cells, where did those all come from originally? However, today what I'd like to do is really focus, as I mentioned, on a project that was only made possible by funding from the NIH, and frankly, this is the research about which I'm most excited at this time. And that is that by studying the origin of animals, we've started to gain what I think are exciting insights into interspecies interactions as they pertain to um, both animal origins and also general phenomena of bacteria regulating eukaryotic biology. So the structure of my talk today will, first of all, be to introduce you to these non-model organisms, which I'll refer to as coanos, which is short for coanoflagellate. Um, and I'll tell you about how the study of coanos is starting to illuminate animal origins. I'll then tell you about how the study of coanoflagellates has let us understand that bacteria are actually regulating key life history transitions. And I'll tell you about how, um, what we've learned about the molecular basis for this control. And finally, I'm going to tell you about extremely fresh new findings from the last few months in which we've discovered a new host microbe interaction that I'll refer to as illicit, hopefully to keep your attention till the end. Okay, so how are we going to understand animal origins? I need to back up and give you some context for thinking about multicellularity. Because when we think about multicellularity, there are, in fact, disparate mechanisms. When we think about the distribution of multicellularity across eukaryotes, there are the animals, there's plants, green algae, fungi, the slime molds, many, many different instances of multicellularity in the tree of life. And when we look at a cellular level, in fact, we see that multicellularity, the cellular foundations of multicellularity in these different lineages are quite different. So, for instance, in animals, cells divide, but they actually have the ability to move relative to each other, and this allows tissue morphogenesis and also allows these organisms to move around in the environment. In contrast, plants, green algae, and fungi all have cell walls that mean that a cell is born where it's going to die. And so cell fate decisions really happen at the point of cell division. And finally, the slime mold dictyostelium um, has the flexibility of cell movement. It doesn't have cell walls, but these are often genotypically different cells that are coming together. And this can set up genetic conflicts that seem to have limited the level of multicellular complexity in this lineage. And this, these disparate mechanisms that we see in these different lineages are actually borne out at the level of the genome. So, for instance, if we compare the genomes of these different multicellular lineages, plants, dictyostelium, fungi, and animals, 
what we find is that the genes they share in common are actually the genes for basic cellular housekeeping, cell division, metabolism, uh, DNA replication, whereas the genes that are different in these diff different lineages are often the ones that are actually mediating multicellularity, okay? And so it turns out that multicellularity has evolved many, many different times in the tree of life, probably over 20 times. I'm just showing you a simple version of this tree. And the point is that the multicellularity of plants, fungi, and animals all evolved independently. This is why these organisms are using different cellular mechanisms and different sets of genes. And so if we compare the multicellularity of these three lineages, we're not going to actually gain, the, the common ancestor was not multicellular. We're not going to gain any insight into the mechanisms by which multicellularity evolved. So in my laboratory instead, we've focused on a group of organisms that represent the closest living relatives of animals. And these are the coanoflagellates or the coanos. So let me tell you, take a few moments to introduce you to coanoflagellates. Coanos are microbial eukaryotes. They live in every body of water you might look at, fresh water, marine. Um, the best source of coanoflagellates I've found is actually a trough used by cattle in the Swiss Alps. So, um, they, they are abundant and diverse. But they all have a shared body plan, or cell plan, if you want to call it. So there are about 5 to 10 microns. There's an ovoid cell body, an apical collar of actin-filled microvilli, and a long apical flagellum. And if this cell looks a little bit like a sperm cell, I want you to keep that comparison in mind because I think it's relevant. Now that flagellum beats, it undulates in a sinusoidal wave in a plane, and that beating actually generates water currents. Um, that draw water and particulate material, most importantly bacteria, up against the collar. And so the form of coanoflagellates is actually linked to their function. Coanoflagellates are voracious bacteriovores, and what they do is they capture bacteria against their collar, and then they eat them by phagocytosis, moving the bacteria down to the base of the cell. So coanoflagellates are, in fact, obligate bacteriovores. That is how they make a living. Now, um, coanoflagellates actually have been poorly studied by molecular and cell biologists, but were at one time a source of great fascination by early microscopists. And so this is William Seville Kent. He was uh, um, a tutor, but also very interested in things that he could see through, his, through the improving uh, microscopic technology. And so he would actually, he published a monograph on coanoflagellates, and you can find plate upon plate of his drawings of these incredible organisms. And he got a lot right about their um, uh, cellular structure. And one of the things that fascinated him about these cells was that they looked indistinguishable from cells that he could see in sponges called collar cells or coanocytes. And I think you can see that similarity a little bit better using modern SEM imaging. Here again is a coanoflagellate cell with the cell body, the microvilli, and the long flagellum. And what you see in sponges is they have uh, nearly indist indistinguishable cells. And just like the coanoflagellates, these cells have an undulating flagellum that generates water currents and pulls bacteria into the collar. So these cells are, the cells in coanoflagellates and sponges are thought to have a shared evolutionary history. If you map these cell types now onto a simple phylogenetic tree, here we have the coanoflagellates as the sister group to animals. We have the sponges and other animals. And, uh, and these, uh, as I told you, sponges have collar cells, but so do many different phylogenia. And some of these cells are, look very much like collar cells, and others look like they're derived from a collar-like cell. For instance, uh, sperm look like coanoflagellates that have lost their collar. Epithelia look like arrays of coanoflagellate cells um, in, that have been tightly packed. And so we're interested in the future in trying to understand whether these cells all have a shared evolutionary history. <clears throat> Through comparative cell biological approaches and comparative genomics, we've started to gain a picture of what the biology of the last common ancestor of animals might have looked like. We think that it was a simple multicellular organism with a protoepithelium of tightly packed cells that had polarity, and that at least some of those cells looked like modern coanoflagellates. 
And these cells were likely eating bacteria, so they were also professional bacteriovores. Moreover, because all animals have sperm and egg and undergo a sexual cycle, um, we think that the first animals did as well, that they produced eggs and sperm, they underwent fertilization to produce a zygote, and that through rounds of cell differentiation and cell division followed by gastrulation produced um, uh, the multicellular form. And so we can, our hope then is that by studying coanoflagellates in molecular detail and comparing their biology to the biology of modern animals, we can start to give more detail to this very early sketch of what the first animals might have looked like. How, sorry. Okay, so um, in the laboratory, we're interested not only in reconstructing animal origins, but also using coanos to illuminate fundamental properties of animal cells. And so I've told you that we've been using evolution, uh, evolutionary comparisons to do ancestral genome reconstruction, but we also think that coanos can be valuable in many other domains. For instance, understanding the regulation of cell polarity, the core functions of proteins and protein families. Claire mentioned that they have cadherins, receptor tyrosine kinases and integrins, and we're interested in understanding the ancestral functions of these proteins. They can be used to study the regulation of cell differentiation. But today what I'd like to do is really focus on their value as an emerging model for studying host microbe interactions. Now why would we be interested in studying host microbe interactions in coanoflagellates? Well, if you look across animal diversity, in fact, as you know, bacteria are not solely pathogens. They are often intimately linked to and regulatory of important biological processes in animals. So for instance, um, in vertebrates, they're involved in the regulation of immune system development. In some organisms, they're required for proper gut maturation. Um, you may be familiar with really beautiful work from Margaret McFall Nye about the use of Vibrio fisheri by the squid to stimulate uh, light organ development. And finally, there's um, a really rich history of study uh, that has revealed that many marine invertebrates, their larvae will only settle when they see cues from certain bacteria. In fact, if you look at the diversity of these types of interactions, it suggests that bacterial interactions with animals have been pivotal since the beginnings of animal evolution. Moreover, if you look at the history of bacterial life on Earth, it's clear that bacteria were here first, and they dominated the oceans in which animals evolved. And so our hope is that by studying interactions between bacteria and coanos, we might learn something both about the basic mechanisms of these interactions and also how they influenced animal origins. Now, the star of today's talk is this organism, S. rosetta. This is a coanoflagellate, which was actually isolated from nature as a, what we call a rosette colony. If I didn't tell you this was a coanoflagellate, I hope that you might think it was an invertebrate uh, uh, larva or, or early stage embryo. But in fact, it's a coanoflagellate, and this is as far as it's going to get. So we've been very interested in understanding how the cells in these rosettes interact and how this process is regulated. <clears throat> now, the first thing I'm going to do is show you how rosettes form, because the development of rosettes really looks like early animal embryogenesis and does not look like the aggregation that you see in Dictyostelium. So when a when it, uh, S rosette is induced to form a rosette, what happens is that a single cell will undergo serial rounds of cell division to produce a sphere of cells. So as you'll see, the cell divides repeatedly to produce a ball of cells. The cell division rate is about six hours, and so the size of the um, rosette is really determined based on the amount of cell divisions that, are, that occur. The interesting thing is that if you look by SEM um, at these rosettes, what you see is that neighboring cells are connected by fine intercellular bridges that we think are the product of incomplete cytokinesis. So these cells are actually attached to each other physically through this shared intercellular bridge. What I'm not showing you is that they are also embedded in a field of extracellular matrix that's secreted during the process of rosette development. Now, um, rosette development itself is only one part of what turns out to be a rather complicated life history. And so you'll remember I told you that I think S. rosetta has the potential to tell us about cell differentiation. 
It turns out that S rosetta is actually undergoing a lot of differentiation, but here it's not spatial, it's temporal, and it's regulated by environmental conditions. So not only can it form these spherical rosettes, but it has a, the slow swimmer cell it can form from. It can produce chain colonies in which cells divide in line. This cell can land and produce a theca to attach to substrates. And these cell types can differentiate into what's called a fast swimmer cell, which is, which is a dispersal stage. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'd like to focus primarily on this transition, this developmental switch that determines whether this cell is going to become this, as opposed to dividing and swimming apart to remain single-celled or um, following this developmental pathway. This is the thing that I wanted to study, actually starting with my postdoc. I wanted to understand how this was controlled, just the same way as a developmental biologist might want to know how Drosophila goes from egg to embryo to adult. <coughs> Pardon me, do I have water up here? Ah, I cleared you, I put it right there. Um, so, right here, I'll take it. A brief pause, okay. So <clears throat> there was a problem in my ability to study this phenomenon. And the problem was that once S. rosetta was brought into the laboratory, it was primarily in single cells, I hope you can see them here, with only the rare occasional rosette. In fact, I had to hunt around for a rosette for this picture. So rosettes were rare, and I couldn't control when they formed, so that meant that I couldn't do the types of comparative approaches Today, you might do RNA-seq or some other approach, because I couldn't get pure cultures of the different life history stages. And this is incredibly frustrating um, and discouraging, frankly. And we spent a lot of time, once I started my lab at Berkeley, trying to figure out conditions that would cause this culture to shift either fully into rosette development or fully into single-cell development. But we were unsuccessful. However, um, we finally gave up, frankly, and instead decided to sequence the genome of this coanoflagellate and compare it to the genome of the single-celled coano that we had already sequenced. And that's when we had a breakthrough. Because when we treated with antibiotics to reduce the diversity of bacteria in this culture, we actually ended up with a culture that never formed rosettes. Now, there might be some simple, trivial explanations for this. You might be thinking, oh, it's starvation, or it's a stress response to the antibiotics. But we could remove the antibiotics, and they remained single-celled. And there was um, uh, also the culture was proliferating rapidly, suggesting that it was getting plenty of food. And so this raised the tantalizing possibility that there might be bacteria here, although uh, at low concentrations, that might produce something that would cause the coanos to switch into a multicellular state. And in fact, when we took these bacteria, plated them out, and then tested them by adding, adding them back to this non-colony forming culture, we were able to rescue rosette development. This was actually work by um, an undergrad in the lab, Rick Zuzo at the time. And, and what we found was that a single species of bacteria from this environmental culture was sufficient to drive robust rosette development. Not only that, we could use conditioned media from that bacteria and also drive the transition. So this bacterium was one that had not previously been characterized. It's in the um, group, Al or, sorry, the genus Algorophagus, and it's a member of the Bacteroidetes bacteria. And this is interesting because Bacteroidetes are among the most, most abundant bacteria in your gut, and they're also one of the most abundant groups of bacteria in the oceans. Um, and so our hope was that we could try to understand how this bacterium, Algorophagus, was controlling this and potentially learn some general rules about how bacteria influence, Bacteroidetes bacteria influence eukaryotes in general. So our goals then were to figure out what were the relevant bacterial molecules. As a result of this, we've actually learned something about the logic of these types of interactions. Um, and, and I want to talk briefly about why coanos might be responding to bacterial cues to determine this critical life history transition. 
So the way we went about this was to use um, rosette development as a bioassay and add back different components of the bacteria to test whether they drove this switch. And I want to point out that this work was part of a really wonderful collaboration with John Clardy at Harvard Medical School. It began with a former postdoc in my lab, Rosie Alligato, who now has her own lab at the University of Hawaii, and has been continued by a top-notch graduate student in the lab, Ariel Wozniaka. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to do was figure out broadly what was the nature of the molecules that the bacteria were using to control this transition. And so we did, you know, your standard biochemical approaches. And we were quickly able to rule out DNA, RNA, and sadly for me, as a biochemist, protein. <laughs> um, and instead, it looked like we were going to have to dive into the very scary cell envelope of these bacteria. And I say scary because um, these bacteria uh, not only have LPS and peptidoglycan, which are well-known immunostimulatory molecules, but also diverse lipids, including sphingolipids. And so it turned out that the activity that induced rosette development in this case was entirely encapsulated in the lipid fraction. And so it looked like it was going to be a new kind of molecule. So what we then did was to take bulk lipid fractions and subfractionate them and now test these fractions one at a time in this culture and ask which of them could induce this switch. And so here you can see there are two fractions that induce. One induces quite well and the other less so. And so we then subfractionated these lipid fractions and continued until we had pure, pure samples that we could both use to induce rosette development and also determine their structure. The first one that we discovered, we named RIF1 for rosette-inducing factor one. And there, this is it. This is the first known regulator of coanoflagellant multicellularity. And this is a lipid. And this, this was a very interesting molecule for a variety of reasons. The first was that this is a novel class of signaling molecules. This, never, this group of molecules had never previously been implicated in regulating these types of interactions. Interestingly enough, though, it's chemically related to a well-known group of lipids called sphingolipids, which are ubiquitous in eukaryotes. They're found in a, a tiny fraction of bacteria, and they're important, they have important roles in regulating developmental processes as well as cancer progression. And so it was interesting to find that this class of molecules, which is somewhat related, was regulating this transition from being single-celled to multicellular. What was known about these lipids is that they are involved in regulating gliding motility in bacteroidetes. So it was very exciting to find this molecule, and this has actually been published. Um, but there was a problem. It turns out that although RIF1 is sufficient to induce some rosette development, it's definitely not the whole story. So you're going to see a few graphs like this. In the y-axis, you'll see the percent of cells in rosettes, and then you'll see what the treatment was. And so what I want you to see is if we use live algorophagus, we get somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of cells in rosettes, so very um, efficient rosette development. Whereas if we use uh, uh, purified RIF1, we get a very low level of induction. And here you can see a titration, and you see that maximum induction is actually in the femtomolar range. But that maximum induction is somewhere between 1 and 1.5% 1 of cells, so rather discouraging. Um, so we, were, we wanted to find out what was going wrong. And I've actually removed some slides on the role of OMVs. If anyone's interested in OMVs, I can talk about it later. They turned out uh, that this molecule is in OMVs, but the OMVs are not essential to the story. What it turns out is that there were actually other lipids that were important. And so if we go back to these inducing fractions, here's RIF1, but there's a second lipid called RIF2, and it is structurally very similar to RIF1, with just a few changes, for instance, in its length and also the stereochemistry of some of these hydroxyl groups. So there seems to be a very tight structure-function relationship. And what I should say that I'm not showing here is that the vast majority of sulfonolipids do not induce. Okay, so this seems to be very important that they have these structures. So we then tested whether RIF1 and RIF2 explain all of the inducing activity of the bacteria. And in fact, they don't. So here again, for reference, is our RIF1 curve alone. The maximal induction of RIF1, remember, is right around here. Now, if we just look at RIF2 alone, 
it's a little over 10 percent. And now if we have RIF1, RIF2, and another uh, sulfonylipid that seems not to have activity on its own, we're getting around 25 percent. So this is good. This is getting better. But we are still missing important activity from the, bac from the bacteria. Now, as I mentioned, the delivery in OMVs doesn't matter. And so my graduate student began to think about how could we have missed this? We've been extremely thorough. We know all the activities in the lipid fraction. And yet these two molecules are the only ones we can find that are active. So what she did was she hypothesized, could it be that interactions among different lipids might be essential to untap all of the activity? from the bacteria. And so she tested all of these lipid fractions now in pairwise combinations. And sure enough, so here's our two fractions that have activity. There were two unexpected areas of activity. So this fraction, AM16, does not induce at all on its own. No activity whatsoever. But if you mix it with one of these inducing fractions, now you get high levels of activity. So that was very exciting. What was surprising was that there were two other fractions that had no activity either, but now when we mix them, they inhibited. So it looks like we have synergizing activity on the one hand and inhibitory interactions on the other, and we couldn't have found them without already having identified these molecules that are able to activate on their own. So, <clears throat> pardon me, this is the inhibitory and the synergizing, and so we followed the same strategy that we had used for the discovery of RIF1, um, and that was continued rounds of subfractionation and bioactivity guided isolation to find the inhibitory molecule, which we've named um, inhibitor of rosettes one, and then this other class of molecules, which actually belongs to a very different group of lipids called lysophosphatidylethanolamines, or LPEs. Now, this EOR1 is very similar to the rosette-inducing factors, as you'll see in a moment. The LPEs, on the other hand, again, like, the, like sphingolipids, are found ubiquitously within eukaryotes, but their signaling roles, again, are relatively poorly understood. <clears throat> so what was exciting about the discovery of these LPEs is that we could now add the LPEs to the RIFs and fully recapitulate the rosette-inducing activity. So here again, we see the percent of cells in rosettes. If you just use media, you get no rosette development. If you use live bacteria, again, you get between 80 and 90 percent. Um, and now I'm going to skip over here and show you the OMVs, give us, again, 80 to 90 percent. And now just the RIFs plus the LPEs purified at relatively low concentrations can give us full activation of rosette development. Now here what I'm showing you is at a population-wide basis, the percentage of cells that go into rosettes, but there's another way to think about this. And in fact, the discovery of LPEs revealed to us a, an important part of rosette development that we hadn't previously appreciated. And that has to do with maturation of the rosettes and growth regulation. So here what you're seeing now are the number of cells per rosette. So we take each rosette and ask how many cells does it have in it. And if we treat with OMVs, um, what you see is that each rosette, after about 24 hours of treatment with uh, the OMVs, has about eight cells per rosette with a fair amount of spread. However, if we treat with the purified sulfonylipid, RIF2, these rosettes are rather small. They're only four uh, cells on average, with, and even the maximally sized ones are relatively small. But if we add the LPEs back in, now we go back and we recapitulate the size of the rosettes. How could this be? What is going on? Well, if we look at the stained rosettes, I think we get a better idea. So what I'm showing you here are uh, rosettes that have been stained with an antibody to tubulin and to a protein called rosetteless that we identified in a genetic screen as being essential for rosette development. And we can use rosetteless as a marker to tell us if a cluster of cells is just some glumpy aggregate or whether it's a true rosette. And what we found is that uh, rosettes produced by treatment with OMVs are uh, nice and tightly packed and have a large number of cells, but when we treat with RIF2, they're either quite small or when they get a little bigger, here is a five-cell rosette, 
The cells are, they, they don't have a lot of structural integrity and the cells are spread out. But we know this is a bona fide rosette because it has this protein. Now, if we add the LPEs back in, you see that we get these large and beautifully shaped rosettes. And so it looks like the LPEs are acting at two stages in the process. The first is to bump up the number of cells that go into the rosette induction or rosette development pathway. And the second is to promote the maturation of structurally well integrated rosettes. And so what the, where this leaves us is thinking about lipid signaling during rosette development in the same way that developmental biologists think about gene regulatory networks driven by transcription factors. Because now what we have are activating molecules, RIF2 and RIF1. A synergist, you might think of these as equivalent to enhancers, that promote the activity of these molecules and potentially inhibit the activity of this molecule which is an inhibitor. And together, this network helps to drive both the initiation of rosette development and the stabilization and subsequent maturation of the system. Now, I'm excited about this because it tells us that the, the regulatory logic of rosette development seems to parallel the types of logic that, it, that are used by gene regulatory networks in animal development. But it also speaks to the fact that eukaryotes in nature are being bombarded by many diverse types of signals. And I want to emphasize that these are, all of these signals are coming from a single bacterial species. But there are lots of bacteroidetes that produce structurally similar signals, but those organisms are not able to induce this. So somehow eukaryotes have learned ways to differentiate signal from noise, and it raises the question of how we do that ourselves. Now, why are coanoflagellates listening to bacteria in order to determine whether to form rosettes or not? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of trade-offs in the life history of S. rosetta. So rosettes are actually more efficient at capturing bacterial prey. So it makes sense that they would become rosettes in response to bacteria. But then why not always be a, a, a rosette? Well, it turns out that single cells are better at dispersal. Rosettes, it turns out, can escape from ciliates, but they can't escape from amoeba. So depending on who's out there, they might be sensing different cues to try to hedge against different potential risks and also to maximize potential benefit. Now, at the beginning, I raised the possibility that coanoflagellates could tell us about molecules that matter not only for animal origins, but also for animal microbe interactions. And I can't yet tell you whether that's true, but I do have an exciting early piece of data that might speak to this. And that is that we've actually been screening many diverse bacteria from different phyla to test their ability to induce rosette development. And so these are the Bacteroidetes, and this is the organism I just told you about, Algorophagus. But it turns out that uh, three different gut bacteria, two from the genus Streptococcus, and one, Acromancia mucinophila, which is becoming um, a really interesting new bacterium for thinking about uh, uh, metabolic health, all three of these induce rosette development, and we can use the same types of approaches and are beginning to use the same types of approaches to isolate those signaling molecules. And our hope would be then to take those molecules and test them in the context of gut biology. Okay, so, so I think this has shown that with bacteria we can quickly go from evidence for a host microbe interaction to actually identifying the bacterial molecules that induce that interaction. Now in nature, we suspect that bacteria might be regulating many different aspects of coanoflagellate biology. And so we've been curious about whether we could identify bacteria regulating other parts of this process. The challenge, as I told you, is that when we discovered bacterial regulation of multicellularity in S. rosetta, it really was serendipitous. We weren't looking for it. It's not even clear how you could look for such an interaction, given that these types of interactions are so specific. And so, fortunately, we have stumbled upon a new example, again, without looking for it. Okay, how did this happen? So I, I showed you this tree previously. I apologize that you can't read these, but let me say that there's one species on here, Vibrio fishri, that has no rosette-inducing activity. 
But this is an interesting organism for other reasons, and we were using it as a negative control for rosette induction. So we would add it, they wouldn't form rosettes, we would do RNA-seq and use it for comparisons. But this uh, graduate student, Ariel Wozniak, is incredibly keen-eyed. And so she came to me one day, I'll, I'll come back to why we care about Vibrio. She came to me one day and said, ah, I don't know what's going on, but every time I add Vibrio, the cells start swarming around and then clumping. So here's uh, control cells that have been treated with their normal bacteria. And you can see, I hope, that they're all single-celled. But when treated with Vibrio, they do this swarming and then they clump. Now this is very different from rosette development. These are aggregating. These would not be expressing rosetteless. So what are they doing? And frankly, we'd never seen this behavior before, and so we weren't sure what it was. But we suspected that it might be something meaningful, and I'll come back. So I skipped the two slides that I've just added, which is why should we care about Vibrio? Well, Vibrio, obviously, are important pathogens. This is a picture from Haiti um, with terrible incidents of cholera caused by Vibrio infestations. Vibrio can um, form these really terrible biofilms. But they've also been incredibly informative about uh, signaling interactions between bacteria in terms of quorum sensing. And they're important parts of the marine ecosystem. And you may be aware of really seminal, beautiful work on a, an essential symbiosis between the, the squid, Eupremna, and Vibrio fisheri. And this is work that's really been spearheaded by Margaret McFall Nye and Bonnie Baffler. So the fact that this behavior was stimulated by Vibrio was very interesting to us. And for a variety of reasons, we began to suspect that the swarming process might actually be part of a sexual cycle in coanoflagellates. Now, sex had not previously been observed in coanoflagellates until a former graduate student in my lab, Tara Levin, who went through your post -back program here, um, was, uh, figured out conditions under which coanos would actually mate. And when she did this, she would starve, for up to a cell, starve these cells for up to a week, and she would find a very, very low level, maybe up to 3% at most, that it would undergo mating. And the reason that it was so hard to see um, was because it was infrequent and because it looked like this. So these are two cells that we've provisionally called male because it's sort of sperm-like and female because it's not sperm-like. And, uh, and what they do is this little dance. Hopefully my movie will play. Hmm. I've never had problems with that before. Um, okay, you're not going to see it. But what these cells do is they move around and then they touch and they fuse. And it would appear that my whole... Let's see if I can get up. Ah. So there's the fusion. So that is mating. Not that exciting but, um, to watch, but very cool to have found. OK, so it's, it's relative. Ah, there they go. OK, so, so we wondered whether, in fact, Vibrio is inducing mating. That's kind of cool, bacteria controlling such a pivotal life history event. And so Ariel went about seeing whether these cultures actually had the hallmarks of sex. And so what she saw was that, in fact, after treating with Vibrio, cells would cozy up next to each other. Their membranes would fuse. This new fused cell would lose one flagellum. And then these uh, nuclei would actually fuse together. Now, that's impressive, but there are also processes called parasexual his life histories in which cells fuse, but they don't actually undergo recombination. So we then had to look for recombination. And we could do that because Tara had also isolated a mutant of rosetless, or sorry, of S. rosetta that doesn't form rosettes. So we had two different phenotypes, rosetless and wild type. And these each had different molecular markers. So Ariel mixed these together in the presence of Vibrio isolated diploids, and then uh, induced meiosis, and then she isolated putative haploids and genotyped them to look for recombination. And when she did this, in fact, she found good evidence for recombination. So these in white have the wild type allele, and these in teal, or whatever this color is, have the rosetteless allele. And what I hope you can see is that when we look at these different haploids, there's clear evidence for recombination. In fact, there's so much recombination that we're starting to put together a linkage map. 
Okay, so Vibrio is clearly inducing, reset, or clearly inducing mating, which in itself I think is quite interesting and quite exciting. But we've been inspired based on our success with rosette development to see if we can isolate the aphrodisiac. Okay? And so to do this, we wanted a quantitative assay for swarming and mating. So um, what we did was to use, uh, th this is our normal imaging. We then parse out where all the cells are, and then we measure the size of each clump. And so uh, these, on average, have about one cell per clump. And as you'll see, these that have been indu induced with Vibrio have many more. And so we can quantify this. Here's our control. It, has, again, has about one cell per clump. And now here we see a much greater spread in terms of the number of cells per clump. And so we use this automated assay to, uh, to test different fractions for their ability to induce rosette development. So I am simply showing you this and not even going to tell you what these all are, just to say that we've taken a standard biochemical approach um, to test whether different fractions of Vibrio, like conditioned media or protease-treated or heat-treated um, fractions, are capable of inducing. And um, in a remarkably short period of time, we've actually been able to nail it down. So it turned out that the activity was contained within the capsular polysaccharide fraction. But within that fraction, it appeared that the activity was protein associated. And so I actually um, suggested a crazy approach to Ariel, and she thought it wouldn't work, but for once I was right. Um, and so I'm actually showing you raw data. She ran out the proteins, she and a collaborator in the Clardy lab, then cut out each of these bands and refolded them and tested them one at a time. And she found just one of these, shown here, that was sufficient to induce swarming behavior. And we, now she's shown that it also induces mating. So this is very exciting. But I hope what you're wondering, like, what is the protein? The exciting thing about it being a protein is that we were then able to do mass spec and figure out what it is. And so it turns out that this aphrodisiac protein produced by Vibrio is a high aluronidase. Now, this is a group of enzymes that can digest specific components of the extracellular matrix. And in, Vibrio, in pathogenic Vibrio, hyaluronidase is used to um, digest away some of this ECM and actually invade. So hyaluronidase is important for invasion and infection um, by Vibrio. But by, by potentially coincidence or who knows what, it turns out that animals use hyaluronidase for an entirely different function. Hyaluronidase mediates species-specific sperm-egg fusion. And so in animals, um, it's hyaluronidase that helps to control this process. And so it's very exciting at this point to have pinned down the inducer of mating in the closest living relatives of animals to a bacterial protein that has the same enzymatic activity as enzymes that mediate this interaction in animals. OK, so I've told you two stories today. One is about how bacteria are acting as master regulators of a developmental switch in coanoflagellates. Algorophagous lipids are determining whether these cells are be remaining single-celled or whether they form these rosette colonies. And secondly, I told you this very exciting new discovery that a protein from Vibrio, a hyaluronidase, is sufficient to induce sex in coanoflagellates. And what I failed to tell you is that it's, it works within two hours, and we get 80 to 90 percent of cells undergoing cell, uh, going fusion. So it's really improved the efficiency of this process in the lab. So in closing, I think what's exciting is that we're learning that coanos are learning about their environment by sensing and responding to diffusible cues from bacteria. So these signals are regulating life history transitions. And as I pointed out, these are in the closest living relatives of animals. So these interactions have the potential to bear both on animal origins themselves, but also potentially illuminate rules that mediate host microbe interactions in animals themselves. I, th I think and hope that coanos are going to prove to be an ongoing valuable model for identifying important bacterial cues that are capable of signaling important um, biological processes. And so in the future, we're hoping to exploit these types of interactions 
to potentially identify bacterial cues that might matter in a biomedically relevant context. I'd like to close by thanking the really wonderful members of my lab and, and particularly thanking John Clardy, who has been a wonderful collaborator. We couldn't have done this work without him. And I really need to emphasize the important role that funding from the NIH has had in supporting our work. And I would love to take any questions. So, so with those two, two lipids, Nicole, uh, or two, there's three lipids, but two of one and one of the other, mm -hmm. is, is one regulating them sticking together and the other one regulating them uh, undergoing, uh, d d d does the division rate change at all? Is the, di the division rate doesn't change at all. Um, one thing we wondered about was whether they might be poisons of cytokinesis because the, it's an incomplete cytokinesis event, but it turns out that the chains also have uh, cytoplasmic bridges, and they form those bridges in the absence of the, the inducing lipids. So, um, so what's clear is that the inducing lipids, the, the sulfonolipids, are important for the first step, and it's clear that the LPEs are also important for that first step, but what, what's possible is that the LPEs are also acting later in the process to improve the stability, including, for instance, secretion of extracellular matrix proteins. So do you think these are like uh, pre-hormones, sort of? Are they what? Like hormones. Yeah, they might be. They might be. And they act at, uh, RIF1 acts at femtomolar concentrations, um, and RIF2 is acting at micromolar. So these are acting at very, very low concentrations. So, um, yes. so you show that uh, these bacteria secrete lipid molecules that influence the life cycle of the coanodes. Do the bacteria get anything out of this themselves? Right. So the question is, are the bacteria getting anything out of this? So um, we don't really know. And I, I think that there's, I'm very interested in how the coanodes might be influencing the bacteria. Uh, so one hypothesis would be that the bacteria, what bacteria get out of it is avoidance of predation. but. The fact that the coanos eat better when they're in a rosette suggests that's not true. What I can say is that these lipids are really intrinsic to the cell membranes of the bacteria. I suspect that they are normal uh, parts of sulfonolipid and sphingolipid metabol metabolism, and the bacteria are going to make them no matter what, and they can't, yeah, get, can't get out of it. <laughs> So did you have a chance to look at this uh, junction between these two cells? So what is it there that yeah. so, hold them together? Right, so we've done TEM as well, and uh, there are two electron-dense plates that seem to be forming barriers to ribosomes. We can see ribosomes backing up on either side, but there is cytoplasm in the middle. Um, and we're curious, we of course want to know whether small molecules can transit across that intercellular bridge. We've talked to people who study ring canals and uh, mid-bodies, um, and we don't see any microtubules going through there, but uh, I understand that sometimes they're there and you can't see them. So we don't really know much about the These intercellular These are not bridge. connection type of proteins? Connexins. Connexins. Um, I, I'm trying to remember, but I don't believe there are any connexins encoded in the genome of Quano. So in, we haven't looked. In this multicellular organism formation, from single cell, so it looks like they developed a parallel system. When we think of cell integration and forming a clusters, we think of cell addition molecules, we think of integrins right. and uh, interacting with the extracellular matrix proteins. So they are membrane and extracellular interactions. So, That's but right. these are lipid mediated interactions. So they are. are yeah. So we don't think the lipids are mediating cell-cell adhesion in this case. And what a point I failed to make clearly is that the inhibitory molecule ER1 looks like a hydrolyzed activating molecule. It looks like a, it may be a competitive inhibitor for a receptor. So we actually think the lipids are acting as ligands and that there are receptors that we have yet to identify that are probably at the head of um, a, a, a pathway of genes that regulates development. Is some of this process related to biomembrane or film formation in quorum sensing in bacteria? 
I don't think so. You mean in the case of Vibrio? So we've tested all the quorum sensing molecules. None of them matter. And we've even tested mutants in the quorum sensing pathway, and those are fully competent. So far, this molecule, hy hyaluronidase, seems to be the only one that induces this activity. OK, so if you'd like to join uh, Nicole and ask her more questions, there's a reception in the hallway after. And I'd like to thank you for a really awesome, exciting talk. Thank you.